was born in jail, and then they proceeded to do medical experimentation on Velma and her baby. What was Mackenzie King's motto of the Jewish immigration? None. None is too many. It is so appalling, Canada's history, and it's continuing. And what we're trying to do, and we're very active in trying to get a new citizenship act, because what we need is cases like Heather, and Heather's the one that has lived off $100 a month with her children because she has no rights. She can't work, she has no medical. You've heard the stories and the horror stories. But Heather is still in limbo. So what I'm doing, I'm going to pass a couple of, they're in the back, and they're here. If I can get 25 signatures on these four petitions, we can put these into the House of Commons next week. And I'm going to ask for Heather's citizenship. And I'm going to ask for about the 30 remaining people to be recognized. I'm going to ask that our board debt be recognized. I'm going to ask that they appoint what Donovan said, a citizenship ombudsman. Because Canada, the Canadian citizenship law is so confusing, nobody knows who is or who is not a citizen. And I'm going to ask that uh, we do an, an entirely new Citizenship Act. Because remember, the Citizenship Act that we're currently living under was done in 1977, well before the Charter. So it is not Charter compliant. And now you know a little more of the story. And Please, go onto my webpage. Buy my book if you really want to see some horrendous stuff. I mean, in the 1930s, Mackenzie King, the then Prime Minister, uh, was contacted by the Hitler's government and said, you're so good at discriminating based on race. And you're getting away with it. How are you doing it? And Mackenzie King responded, that was the treatment of the First Nations people which Canada was kind of the role model of apartheid on the way they treated the First Nations people. It's still going on. So I will pass these. You'll see them in the back. I would appreciate everybody signing it. Read them. Because it's, go ahead, it's the only way we're going to facilitate change. And uh, we have a group of very smart people that are going into Ottawa. We met with a lot of people yesterday. I'm meeting tomorrow with the chairman of the Citizenship Committee. Uh, and uh, I met with a senator yesterday, and they're all saying they would be happy to start getting involved in a brand new Citizenship Act. And how important is that? Well, Canadians have know really a lot about immigration. They know a lot about refugees. They know nothing about citizenship. And in the word citizenship, the C for citizen comes before the I. Now, I did it backwards. I had to become an immigrant to my own country, even though I was a citizen. But we need to make sure that the refugees and the immigrants become good citizens, not the other way around. So we need to show the world, this is our chance to shine in Canada, to put current values into a citizenship act, to make it inclusive, that women and men are all equal, this is our chance, and we're really right about there. And again, I put seven bills into Parliament, three passed, two unanimously. About a million people have received citizenship. I'm different than most everybody in here in that I'm not a member of a group. I'm a private individual. And as an airline pilot, if I ditch an airplane in the Hudson River, I don't leave five people there, you know, and get out. I try to rescue everybody, and that's what we need to do in citizenship law. I want to just show you a couple of things that we've been very good. These are four separate parties, Bloc, Liberal, NDP, and Conservative, and we got them all working on one direction on this, and I think we can do it again for the next round. I want you to see something that you probably have no idea and in September of 2007, the United Nations UNHCR magazine, Refugees, did a study on statelessness. Highlighted dead center in that magazine 
for the lost Canadian. Canada was compared to Zimbabwe, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and Cambodia in their human rights record on statelessness. Didn't really make the news in Canada. But we made the news in The Economist magazine, where they said, lost in Kafka land. When is a Canadian not a Canadian? But you really didn't see it in the Canadian media too much. In my book, and please excuse it, it sounds crude, but I did it on purpose. I wrote a chapter called Dog Poop, Farts, Toads, and Brittany Spears. <laughs> and I wrote it that way because in 2006, the government of Canada put 67,000 war brides and their children, big wigs like Senator Romeo Dallaire, to boot them out of Canada because they said they were never citizens. That was in 2006. The Canadian press didn't do one story on it. 67,000 people. Yet, Lindsay Lohan, Britney Spears, Paris Hilton, and Celine Dion had 345 stories on them. In an 11-year time frame, lost Canadians in the Canadian press was 31. Cats was 4,896. See, that's the problem, is the media doesn't care. So the people don't know. They're not engaging. So you're hosed. Consequently, you get people like Donovan and Heather. So this can be a movement. What kind of a movement? The same movement as my tie. Because my tie is a Tuskegee Airmen tie. Does anybody know who the Tuskegee Airmen are in here? The black pilots of World War II, who, by the way, Dr. Martin Luther King was 13 years old when the Tuskegee Airmen did the first nonviolent protest. I'm a member of the Tuskegee Airmen, and yet I don't fit the profile. I'm also a member of Pacific Unit 280, which is the Chinese World War II veterans, and nobody here knows that story about the Chinese war vets. It's fascinating. And they know. They're the one group in all of Canada that really related to me because they were told, you're not citizens. Actually, First Nations, too. We are our brother's keeper. The only way we're going to get through this is to band together. We've got an opportunity here to change Canada, but not just Canada, to change the world because the ripples go everywhere. If we can get a new citizenship act that's inclusive, and has our new values, and takes values from the First Nations people that were wonderful, and puts them in our act, we can show the world that it can be done, because just about 60 years ago, Velma Demerson was in jail because she married somebody of a different uh, ethnicity. That would be my daughter today. She married a Filipino man. So where have we come in 60 years? And where can we go in another 60 years? We have a movement. As Jocelyn said, it's right here in this room. Please sign the petition. And any questions you have, uh, I need a lot of help. I've been a private individual, no group. Academia didn't touch us. No one wanted any part of this. So. Uh, it's been a real hard struggle as a private individual, but that's the other lesson. I did change this country. And a private individual, you've got to be awfully motivated, but you can do it. So thank you very much, and I will turn it back over to you. Thanks so much, Don. Um, we have about 20 minutes for uh, questions, and so uh, we'll invite people to step to the microphone in the middle of the room. Questions for any of our speakers. Somebody has a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have, I have a, I'll start with a question, actually, for you, Jocelyn. I had one that I wrote down. Uh, you were mentioning that you've got um, uh, general meetings in Toronto, you were talking, you know, because uh, CCS is uh, Toronto-based. Uh, how does CCS facilitate uh, participation from people who want to be involved who are not in Toronto? Um, or 
is it impossible at this point? No, it's, it's definitely possible. Uh, we're still young, so uh, what we do now is we just, I think it depends on, on who, 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 who wants to be involved. So um, we work with a lot of students in, uh, in multiple provinces, so we facilitate student internships in-house. Um, legal practitioners may call us from uh, one province and, and uh, I know a lawyer in another province and I'll connect those two legal practitioners. Um, it largely works through us, through um, just personal connections. But um, don't let us being in Toronto scare you. We, uh, we, we, we aim to be a national, have a national presence. I'll add to that, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona for more than half the year. You see, I didn't have citizenship. It took me 47 years to get my citizenship restored. So we did our movement in another country to change Canadian citizenship law. So being in Toronto is a cake. It's a cake. It's a cake. Uh, May, yeah. Hi. My name is Meg McMahon, and I'm a professor at Carleton University. So I'm a colleague of Stasis. Um, I've been here to about all the time so far, and I've really appreciated the presentations and also meeting people. Um, I have a question, and excuse me when I was out of the room for a few minutes if it was dealt with that. But I'm wondering do we have data on people, your know, crimigation thing, people being deported because of having a criminal record? Do we actually know the numbers of people that are being? So, can I just clarify, do we have data on stateless persons being deported because of criminal activity? Not necessarily stateless, but people with a criminal record being ejected. Being, de being deported to because of earlier country. criminal activity, not necessarily yeah. stateless. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I would guess that there would be data on that. Um, in the next panel, we're presenting our data collection study where we looked at the CBSA as one of our agencies and, and with respect to their detention and removals for stateless persons. And we got quite a bit of data back um, through access to information requests. So I assume that if no one has yet undertaken a study looking at non-stateless persons deported because of criminal activity, um, Something's got to be in the works. I, I've been I really think surprised. I've seen the figure somewhere, but I forgot what it was. But I know the surprise would be large. Uh, it's in the area that needs attention. Oh, de definitely. Um, I can I can look that up though. I can see if I can look that up later on. We can connect. But um, the CBSA was very forthcoming with with providing data with respect to their removals on stateless persons, and I assume that there that that data exists for non-stateless persons with criminal activity. Though, um, I know that they, the CBSA does provide specific numbers on the, I think it's both inadmissibility and removals with respect to criminal, criminal activity for stateless persons, um, but they don't go into what that criminality is. Okay, I, I, would, I would just like to add that in 1997, the Supreme Court unanimous decision, Benner versus Canada, Benner, uh, it was one of those cases where Benner's mother was the Canadian, the father was not, but he was a, a, a murderer, and the Supreme Court ruled that uh, once criminality cannot be a factor in it. And it was reaffirmed in 2004 in OJ versus Canada. So criminality, is, again, the courts have determined that's not a factor. Okay, so thank you very much, Tony. That doesn't mean that the government's not trying to kick people out because of it, but the courts have ruled. I just want to point out that this information is available at the uh, by the report made by CBSA on a yearly basis to public. So this is information. Hello, uh, Kieran from uh, the University of Toronto. Um, so I just want to speak to an issue which came up on this panel, but also in the previous panel as well, which is the way in which statelessness can intersect with other forms of vulnerability or other. Uh, I'm not hearing you very much. Yeah, could you? Sorry, um, there we are. 
Um, but a, a subject which came up on the last panel, and then also in the context of a lot of these presentations as well, which is the way in which statelessness can intersect with other forms of vulnerability, and also can be caused by past historical injustices as well. So, I mean, the example I think you spoke to earlier, um, the way in which Canada's past citizenship laws increased or attract other forms of exclusion and the way that reproduces vulnerabilities today. So, I was hoping that perhaps you could speak to ways in which we can try and draw the public's attention in addressing questions of citizenship and nationality and statelessness to the way in which this is based on past historical injustices, uh, but also the way in which it sort of uh, multiplies the forms of vulnerabilities which people face when they're caught in this situation. Uh, and I think that the last time I spoke to this most powerfully in talking about the way in which you have to somehow uh, live off the grid or operate without any of the normal protections which are endowed to uh, you know, citizens. And that, in a sense, leaves you particularly vulnerable to private exploitation because you have no way of uh, having recourse to sort of public protection. I'll tell you what, you, you ended with a statement. I, let me just ask, your question was? So the question was, in terms of trying to you know, mobilize people toward these sorts of issues, uh, I mean, if you could speak to how we can perhaps try and connect public perceptions of the issue of statelessness with these claims of injustice and vulnerability more explicitly, to therefore make it more of a, a political issue. I, I wish I could answer that because I've tried to mobilize Canadians for years on this issue. Um, another thing is, it's not just being stateless. I have people that are currently citizens of Canada being denied all our rights, so what's the difference? You can have, you can be a citizen, and they're telling you, you can't get a driver's license and so forth. So, it's not just statelessness, it's having no rights. I think the best way, I mean, look, we, we've got everybody in here. People seem to be motivated in here. You can go to my webpage, which is lostcanadian.com, but there you go. You've got a great avenue to start this thing. Uh, the Canadian Center on Statelessness. You know, let's, let's do it. And by the way, academia is fab fabulous. I've spoken before several law schools, and when we had a huge judgment in the Taylor case, the judge actually said, I want notes from the class that I spoke in and made the judgment accordingly. So, Students are like bumblebees, they just keep stinging until the government finally gives in. Uh, so I think Jocelyn's right. You get this into the school system, you get it into academia, and then uh, you've got an outlet. We, we're, we're there and willing and ready. Yeah, sure. I just want to make a comment about the notion of rights. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, an author, friend of mine, Bruce Turin, he wrote a book uh, called The Tyranny of Rights. And he, we had several conversations with Brewster because he came to me and he asked me, how come in your language there is no referral to the notion of rights? So we did this site research for, this book, for his book to see which languages actually contain a referral or a notion about rights. And we, don't, we didn't find any. In any language, there is the notion of rights. So the notion of rights is something that comes along with the national states. And actually, you know that everybody on this planet has the right to food. Despite that, there is like millions of people dying of hunger. So having your right enshrined in you know, international documents doesn't assure you that you, you are going to actually eat. Whereas in our cosmovision, in indigenous visions, we have the notion of responsibility. If you, if you have a responsibility towards your children to have them eat, they are going to eat. They don't have to claim a right to nobody. You have to act your responsibility and they are going to be fulfilled in their needs. 
actually, the notion of responsibility is something that comes with motherhood, whereas the notion of rights comes with the patriarchal system. And by the way, if you're going to do a new citizenship act, that's exactly what you put into it, right there, responsibility. Can I just add really quickly, um, I think just to add really quickly that we need to we need to connect um, the little things that uh, people who are stateless uh, go through that we often forget when we talk about really broad macro level global campaigns or um, you know situations of statelessness in Burma or um, Dem um, Dominican Republic. We need to, we often lose sight in that abstract kind of assessment and, and we need to remember that, you know, it means not being able to get a Costco card or a library card. And I think when you bring it down to that micro level, people, it's, it resonates with people a little bit more, um, regardless if it's in the Canadian context or in the global context. And I think that's what part of talking about these issues should be about, is just, it's just bringing it Bring me a home. And I think Marcelo's you know, uh, point about how to kind of bring it, that, that, that there's the Costco card issue, but that there's also this much larger issue, which is much bigger than the Costco card issue, right? That, that this, it has a kind of push and pull effect that these rights carry with them um, a kind of negative effect. Right, too, or at least a narrowing of our horizon. So even as we are set on thinking about citizenship and reducing statelessness, uh, we want to think about, Marcelo, things asking us to not think in just a narrow horizon of, of Costco card, even as we know that Costco card is what matters in some ways so much. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, next question. John, I knew your presentation would be the liveliest of the day. <laughs> And you certainly didn't disappoint me. Uh, during one of the morning sessions, uh, someone mentioned the distinction between uh, de facto and de jure uh, statelessness. Now, few of the lost Canadians are or were uh, legally stateless in the strict sense of being citizens of no country. But imagine being told after a lifetime in Canada that you are not a citizen of the only country you know. Uh, such is the case of a woman named Mary Burbush, who is her name because her case has been public for almost 10 years. Uh, Marion is a retired social worker living uh, in Simcoe, uh, Ontario, in Norfolk County, near Bradford. She's lived there since she arrived in Canada with her British wife mother in 1946. The Marion is what we call a war bride child, uh, born uh, in the UK to a Canadian soldier of the Second World War and a British mother. Now, uh, Marion was first told that she was excluded from citizenship because she was born out of wedlock. And yes, there is that exclusion in Section 4 of the Canadian Citizenship Act 1946. But that bar to citizenship was removed retroactively uh, in 2009 by Bill C-37. But we discovered that it never applied to Marion in the first place because she was actually under Ontario law she was actually legitimated from birth by her parents' marriage. So we believe that Marion has been uh, a citizen uh, since January 1st, 1947. Oh, in, in 2009, I asked Tom Kent to comment on Marion's case. Now, Tom Kent uh, was uh, a policy advisor to Lester Pearson in the 1960s. He also served briefly as Deputy Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Thank you. 
So I asked him to comment on Marion's case. And this is his reply as I remember it. The people you know have not been treated fairly. Exclusion from citizenship in the circumstances you have described is contrary to the very idea of creating citizenship as I have always understood it. The dismissive attitude of officials, as reported, should be unacceptable to the minister. Well, the minister at that time, of course, was Jason Kenney. Now, seven years later, Marion is still being told that she is uh, not a citizen, but at this time, uh, because her father somehow lost Canadian domicile by serving his country in the Canadian Army. Now, do you know how many Canadians were serving uh, Canada abroad by May 1945? Almost half a million. So if Marion's father was never a citizen because he somehow lost Canadian domicile, what about the, 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 the tens and hundreds of thousands of his his comrades in arms. It, it, it's, it's, it's just a channel, both legally and, and, and historically. Robert, I'm going to ask you to, uh, is Eric, 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 can you ask I'm a question? Up. We've got some people behind you. Thank okay. You. Oh, okay, great. Sorry, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, the next two uh, questions to go back to back, if you don't mind, or maybe you guys can make some notes, and then we'll have you answer to the both. Thanks. <laughs> Kikabawari, Nagankan, up to territory. Uh, I just want to mention about Indian Affairs. Uh, in, when it was established, it was to assimilate, integrate, and exterminate the Indian people. And uh, assimilation is learning how to, how to speak the language. Integration is uh, participating in society, having jobs and so on. And extermination is that I don't have no more rights on the land. So like when Trudeau Pierre Trudeau, in 1982, spoke about the native constitution. Is that if we don't have no culture, we don't have no, no right to a constitution. That's part of the extermination of our people. So anyways, able to exterminate a whole nation? That's my question. Thank you. of someone and uh, if the solution is more about giving them um, citizenship or helping them have a social protection in our society. Thank you. Statelessness can be a choice. We saw that at the very beginning work uh, of today's presentations where they said one of the biggest reasons was for lack of uh, what was it, uh, registration of your birth. So that is a choice parents can make on their children. So yes, it can be a choice. Uh, and um, I, I, what was the other question? That... Uh, the other question was um, it was Jacob's question. Um, 
Um, oh. Exactly. Thank you. Just by legislating it into law. That's why it's so important. We're trying very hard to make citizenship a not a legislative privilege, but a constitutional right 